Jai Guru. Guru. Love and greetings to all of you here in the Encinitas Temple and to all devotees and friends all around the world, wherever you may be. God bless you all. Jai Guru. It was so nice to walk down the aisle just then and to come toward the gurus, these beautiful pictures of the gurus here, but then to turn around and to see all of your faces, it's, it's equally as inspiring because God and Guru live in each and every one of you. It's been a beautiful week, hasn't it, so far? And you've gotten a lot of guidance, and we hope you will be able to take that into your homes and practice. Those of us who have been drawn to seek God, who are looking for a deeper connection with God, we have a special responsibility, and that is to bring light into the darkness that's so present in the world these days. And we do that, of course, through our prayers, through our interactions with others, and through becoming the best version of ourselves that we can in this life. So this evening we're going to be talking about the power of silence and how you can make a difference in your life and in the lives of others by creating time and proper environment for silence. One could actually say that everything that you've learned this week, all the techniques, all the inspiration on how to live Guruji's teachings is for the one purpose of drawing you to that deeper silence within, where you can commune with God at will. Our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda said, practice the art of silence. The spiritually deep individual lives day and night in a calm interior silence into which neither menacing worries nor even the crash of colliding worlds can intrude. Guruji lived in that state of silence. Those of you who heard Brother Balananda's uh, class on Tuesday, he mentioned the story of Guruji sitting at the base of that roller coaster with all the screaming people and the noise of that roller coaster, and he was just absorbed in God. He didn't need exterior silence. He was in that calm interior silence into which neither menacing worries nor even the crash of colliding worlds can intrude. But most of us aren't quite there yet, I would say. So we have something to work on. Guruji was showing us that it was possible. But then he continues, the more you are silent, the more happiness you will find. What joy awaits discovery in the silence behind the portals of your mind, no human tongue can tell. But you must convince yourself. You must meditate and create that environment. So are you convinced? Do you make silence time? Good, some of you are convinced. You make silence time and seclusion as important as eating and sleeping? It is that important. There have been studies galore, many, many studies, that show the benefits of silence. And it benefits all aspects of human life. So whether you want to live longer, or have better health, or you want great intuitive ideas, or creativity, or if you want oneness with God. Periods of silence will move you towards these goals. One fascinating study that's going on right now is in uh, classrooms with children. They're teaching children to use American Sign Language to keep the noise level down in the classrooms. And what they're finding is that the children love it, and they're benefiting greatly from it. They're, um, learning, and they're enjoying their learning. And the neurobiologist who's involved in the study said, young children's brains are craving sound to meaning connections. Sound to meaning connections. 
So it's very important that the sounds around them be nourishing and meaningful. And there's even evidence to suggest that attention deficit disorders, which are rampant these days, so prevalent, that in some cases they are caused by or amplified by a constant barrage of meaningless noise within the home. So a child, an infant, who has a television going all the time in the house, when they're trying to learn to get along in the world, to connect with the world, they're trying to learn language, it's confusing for their minds. And so it's not healthy. But it's actually not healthy for any of us. Guruji says, noisy environments have a harmful effect on the nerves and can even create disease in the body. If human beings were not subjected to the bombardment of the sounds of modern living, which are especially harsh in cities, they could live years longer. Learn to enjoy silence. Don't listen to the radio or television for hours on end or have them blaring mindlessly in the background all the time. What Guruji says here has been proven, that those who live in noisy cities have a life expectancy of 12 years less than those who get out into nature and spend time in quiet. So continuous noise keeps the nerves reporting to the brain. And it's the job of the nerves. The nerves are supposed to keep us safe. They're supposed to tell us what's going on in our world and so forth. But if they have to keep reporting that they're sound, they never get a rest and they wear out. And damaged nerves are at the root of many diseases. So what do we do? Some of you live in noisy cities. So what we have to do is learn to be selective. There are sounds within our external environment that we can control, and there are sounds that we cannot control. So there are soothing, nourishing sounds of nature, rain, wind in the leaves, gurgling brooks, soft music, and so forth. But then there's the industrial sounds, horns, sirens, traffic, construction, and so forth. But there's always also television, radio, the internet, podcasts, so forth. These are the ones we have control over. So in our outwardly noisy world, we as adaptable human beings can adapt to just about anything. So we get used to things. I know I was, I was raised in a home where we had a chiming clock. And it was, it was a lovely sound. It chimed every 15 minutes. <laughs> and you did not notice it after a while. You simply didn't notice it. It was in the background fabric of your life somewhere, and you knew it was there. So some of you who live in Encinitas probably don't notice the trains anymore. We get used to it. But it doesn't mean that getting used to a noisy environment is, is good for us, is healthy. I've talked to many people who have said that, it devotees even, that they need to, when they go home, they need to turn that television on. They need noise in the house the whole time they're, they're awake. And they report that no turning it off makes them nervous. A quiet house makes them nervous. But it isn't really the quiet or the silence that causes the nervousness. It's just that they've become used to this noise, this background fabric of their life, and they haven't realized how restless their mind already was. So the silence just points it out. So if you have a hard time being in a silent home, think about this. It isn't that the silence is scary and makes you nervous. It's that 
Your nerves need a, need a rest from all of this noise. Sometimes people get so accustomed to the noise that they are, are even like activity, like someone who's deeply involved in their work, and they're just on the go all the time with their work, never stop and never take a rest. They actually forget how to relax sometimes. So those of you who've been meditating for many years, do you remember the first time that you tried to sit in the silence? Most of us couldn't make it for more than about five minutes. We were so restless, so used to our active lives. But look at you now. Many of you can stay focused for six hours. It takes time. So those of you who are new to meditation, or those of you who are just starting up meditation again, or are still at that restless five-minute point, keep on. Keep on. It takes time to, and patience to tame the mind. But we'll talk about that, a little bit more about that a little later. So a quiet external environment is essential for our overall health, which is why Guruji said, with a five-day working week, people could use Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday for getting away from the noisy city environment and thus increase their longevity. Increase the length of your life by just getting out into nature. The nerves need that silence, the calmness they need to recharge and restore. But external noise isn't just sound. There are a lot of things in our external environment that can be disturbing to our peace of mind. Imagine, for instance, if you were in a room that had no window, and it was stuffy, and it was filthy, and it was cluttered, and it was painted some dismal color. How would you feel? It affects us. Our surroundings affect us because it all has, carries vibration. So light, air, orderliness, cleanliness, and cheerful colors are all, all important. Exposing ourselves to violent or negative images, or even symbolism, things that are in the movies, in video games, These things have an effect on us. They bring us down. In an art class many years ago in in college, a professor had us do an assignment where we, we had to take a large canvas and divide it in quarters with lines, and then paint each quadrant to represent a feeling or emotion using only color and abstract shape. So we weren't allowed to paint anything recognizable. It had to just be color and abstract shape. And he gave us the feelings or emotions that he wanted us to paint. And that was peace, happiness, depression, and anger. And then he sent us home because he didn't want us to influence each other. So it was amazing when we came back how similar all of our paintings were. Peace, light colors, lyric lines, pastel colors. Happiness, bright colors, round shapes, bubbly, round, happy shapes. Depression, muddy colors, blurry, dark, muddy colors. And the shapes were indistinct and and blurred. Anger. Anger was fiery colors, like red, orange, yellow, also with black in it, and, and spiky shapes. You know, like in the comics when someone gets hit, and it says, pow, and they, they draw it out like that. Yeah. So he gave us this assignment to show us that colors have a big effect on, our, on us, on our environment. They can be, they can bring us up, or they can make us feel depressed or angry, and so forth. Guruji says, 
you are affected by color because colors are manifestations of specific vibrations. You should always try to wear and to surround yourself with colors that are harmonious to your nature. Now, of course, we don't want to be extreme about this and only wear one color from now on and so forth. <laughs> but it's a good thing to be aware of. In a study from the University of Delaware, they showed that the predominant colors in your environment, so think about your environment, your home, your work, where do you spend a lot of time, and what are the colors in that environment? They said they have a measurable influence on the frequency and strength of one's brain waves. So this isn't just people who are just sensitive to color and so they like nice color. It's affecting us all. So if you think of the colors in a city, they can be not always the most uplifting because it's industrial. So if you live in a city, it's very important to have your, your home be colors that are harmonious on the inside so that you're surrounded by the colors that, that help you, that benefit you. They said that blues and greens have a calming influence, and Guruji said this too, the blues and greens of nature, blue sky, green plants. And then they said that oranges and reds have an activating influence. So if you think about this, what if you went home and all of the rooms in your house were painted red? <laughs> activating. You may not be able to sleep, it would be so activating. So, so, so color is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about how to make your living environment more peaceful and conducive to silence. So external silence and a peaceful environment are essential. They're very helpful to our health and to our well-being. But as Guruji demonstrated, sitting under that roller coaster, it's the inner silence that's actually most important. And we have many, many things that disturb our, our inner silence, don't we? Think about where's your consciousness much of the time? What happened at home? What happened with one person or another? How are you going to pay your bills? The various different things that happened at work. Brother Anandamoy used to say, people and events, people and events. <laughs> And our mind gets caught up with people and events. So there's another one that's come into our world in the last couple of decades, and that is our cell phones. And I want to make a point of this because devotees are not exempt from cell phone addiction. <laughs> I have seen devotees pull out their cell phone during a meditation and start checking their email. This is not okay. <laughs> can, can you do can you, one hour without the phone? That phone is so addictive. It connects us to people. It's wonderful. I like my phone. The, the, it connects you to people. You can do your work on it and so forth. But when you find that you can't turn it off for a while, you can't be away from it for a while, watch out because it's keeping you tied into the world. And you're going to find, when you leave this earth, that you missed the boat. The ark of silence sailed without you. <laughs> you. You need to do something about it. Don't let it take over your consciousness. So there's thousands of things that keep our minds busy and chattering away all the time. And it can be really hard to shut off. But we have to try. And fortunately, Guruji has given us little techniques in the lessons, lots of them. And in Lesson 7, there are, I think there's five different little techniques on inducing mental relaxation. And you may want to look these up. We're going to practice one of them together. And these little techniques can be done in moments, little gaps of time 
Remember the story that Brother Bhaktananda told about the little technique Guruji gave him to stop his work from time to time, focus his attention at the Christ Center, at the Kutasta Center, and just say, for God and Guru, for God and Guru, and then open his eyes and go back to work again? Have you tried it? It's a good one to try. It ties your consciousness in with God throughout the day. So this little technique that we're going to practice from Lesson 7, I'm going to read it through first and then um, paraphrase it and we'll do it together. So Guruji says, tense the whole body with will, then relax and exhale and feel, keeping the breath out as long as you can without discomfort. While in this breathless state, cast off all restless thoughts and focus for as long as you can on just one thought or feeling, such as God, 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 or joy, joy, joy. Concentrate fully on the God peace within. Okay, so it's very simple. It's, an, it's a tension, a relaxation with the focus at the Christ Center, and while the breath is out, just sincerely and devotedly just saying, God, God, God. And when you need to breathe again, breathe in, breathe naturally and open your eyes again. So let's do this together. So first tense your body. Exhale and relax. Mentally just say, God, 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 mentally. God. When you need to breathe, Inhale again and open your eyes. Okay? So this is a little technique that you can do throughout the day that gives you a tiny moment of silence in the middle of a busy world. You can do this anywhere. You see how long it took? Just a moment. Just one breath's worth. So when we say the name of God, we draw God to us. So this little technique is very purifying for the mind. Now, there's another use for silence. Great thinkers and geniuses, artists, great ones down through the centuries have used periods of silence to get their inspiration. Leonardo da Vinci used to stare into the embers of a fire, or at a blank wall with stains on it. And it would put him into a state of calmness, a state of stillness, where he found that he was tuning into ideas for great works of art. In our current time, Alma Deutscher, who was a child prodigy, she's now 18, she's British, she's a um, composer and a conductor, a violinist and a pianist, she found as a little girl that if she took the rope of her jump rope and held, let the handles hang down and she walked outside swinging the handles around in circles, that it put her in a state of consciousness that where she re could receive musical compositions. So sometimes people have found their way into that library of God's thought through these finding ways that calm them down. Most of you have probably had some moment in your life where you suddenly knew something. You were calm, you were sitting somewhere calmly, and suddenly you knew something, and you knew you knew it. It wasn't a question, it was just this was the, this is the truth. A very sweet little example of this happened a number of years ago. My mother, <clears throat> who was legally blind, had attended a picnic for blind people. And during the picnic, someone carried around a large jar of jelly beans and was having people guess how many jelly beans were in the jar. And my mother was at a picnic table with some other people. And as the man carrying the jar walked in back of her, a number came into her mind. And she knew beyond a doubt, she said, that was the number of jelly beans in that jar. I just knew it. So 
she gave her guess, and they were very surprised to find out that when they counted those jelly beans, it was the exact number. So how did this happen? It wasn't through her senses, because they hadn't counted the jelly beans yet, so no one could have told her. She couldn't see, so she didn't even see the jar. She didn't touch it like other people did. It was because her state of consciousness, the lake of her consciousness at that moment was so clear and calm and silent that her intuition could re reflect the truth to her conscious mind. Now, most of the time, our intuition is trying to reflect the truth to our conscious mind. But our mind is like this, ruffled up, dealing with the world, stuff on the surface, people and events. We need to calm it down. We need to go into the stillness, into the silence, so that we can have that truth reflected to our minds. We all have this sixth sense of intuition, every one of us. And all thoughts are God's thoughts. So when we go and sit in the silence, we draw on the area of God's thought that we are interested in. So someone like Leonardo da Vinci interested in art. In the silence, he got these ideas for great masterpieces of art. If we're looking for the cure for an illness, it's going to be in the stillness that we get those ideas. If we're looking for God alone, we go to God alone. And if we want to know how many jelly beans are in a jar, we can know that too. Because every thought, big thoughts, Little thoughts, all thoughts, are God's thoughts. There's a vast library of, of, of thought, of all knowledge, all wisdom. And we can tune into that in our silence. Now, the purpose of meditation is to find God. It's to reach a deeper silence beyond all of these marvelous thoughts. We're to go within into that deeper silence and find God's presence. Which, so what happens when we try to meditate? Well, sometimes this is when we get some of our greatest ideas, isn't it? Because if we're not 100% focused on seeking God and God alone, then we stop off in the library. We, we go to that area of interest, of what is interesting to our mind. So to find God, we need to be one-pointed on God alone and work our way through that library of thought, beyond all thought and utterance, beyond all matter and mind, as Guruji said, endless bliss. We have to get through that area of all knowledge and thought without being tempted to run off into it and get lost in it. So there's nothing wrong, though, with having a special time to have creative thinking. God expects us to use his thoughts to use his ideas and his creativity. But just don't do it during meditation. <laughs> so have a separate time and have a separate place. Don't go doing your creative thinking in your meditation area, because what happens is that vibration of thinking and activity is still is presented in your meditation area. You want your meditation area to be for God alone. So have a separate time, completely, completely separate. It could be right before meditation. And in a separate area, do some deep breathing. Do some 
Dancing and relaxing, call on God and Guru. Do a little Hong Sa, and then attempt to sit in the silence. Have a, pa a pad and pen or your tablet or whatever you take notes on available, and jot down thoughts as they come to you. And then return to sitting in the silence again. Jot down thoughts. Do this for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Longer if you have the luxury of time. And then time box it. Put a cap on it. Say no. We're done now. Now it's time for meditation. If you do this on a regular basis, if you have a separate time for creative thinking, and it's not just creative thinking, it could be planning, it could be um, processing an unpleasant event and you're just writing down just to get the thoughts out of your mind. Whatever it is that's disturbing the consciousness, write it down outside of the meditation area. Then go to meditation, full focus on God and Guru. We have to, we have to overcome that temptation to play with thoughts during meditation. It's very tempting because the thoughts are good. We're getting into deeper areas of God and Guru's library, and we're finding, we're learning things or understanding things that we, we didn't know before. But don't do it during meditation. Dayamataji said, bring your consciousness into attunement with Divine Mother. And when the time for meditation comes, everything else should go out of your mind, including all thought of the body. There should be absolute stillness within. It can be done, but you have to make the effort. Use your weekends for meditation, for seclusion, to renew your spiritual strength within. If you meditate regularly and deeply, it will change your whole life. So some of you may be thinking, my weekends? I need my weekends to catch up. There's just so much going on during the week. I barely get time to get all my duties done. That's understandable. It's understandable. However, if we treat meditation and relaxation times as dispensable, we're actually increasing our duties and activities because we become inefficient, we make poor choices, we get exhausted so everything takes longer, we become imbalanced and we have inharmonious conversations with others because we're not in tune. Guruji gave me a very tangible lesson in this, when I was a novice nun, at that time the novices did a lot of uh, the physical care of the ashram, car washing and, and you know, taking care of the buildings and so forth. So I had a, a, a pretty sizable list that I needed to do during a weekend and by the end of Saturday I still had a sizable list. And I thought, oh, I have to have this done by Sunday. But Monastics are encouraged to have a six-hour meditation uh, every Sunday. And I thought, how am I going to do this? How do I have a six-hour meditation and do all these duties that are going to take 12 hours to do? And at that moment, a thought came into my mind so strong. It was, it was from my own consciousness, but it was, it was as if I had been, it had been told to me. And it just said, the purpose of life is to find God. So that has to come first, no matter what. And I thought, uh-oh, I better trust this. Mm -hmm. And I put my to-do list aside, and I went off and had a six-hour meditation. And at the end of six hours, I found that a couple of the nuns had mistakenly thought it was their turn to do some of the duties. Thank you, Master. <laughs> And I was able to complete everything else on my list easily in the next two hours. Because my mind was calm, clear. Everything went 
efficiently, smoothly. Do you know that? You notice that sometimes, that when, when you're in tune, time seems to stretch. It seems like you have plenty of time when you're in tune. So we always make time for the things we consider important, don't we? So why not some extra quiet time, some seclusion time? Dayamata said, meditation is different from seclusion. Seclusion means setting aside some time to be alone, perhaps on weekends, on a Sunday, or just an hour or two during the weekday. This is a time for relaxation, introspection, and study. It may also include periods of meditation. Master started our self-realization retreats to give devotees the opportunity for seclusion, to get away occasionally from all their worldly concerns in order to think of God and to have longer and deeper meditations. So those of you who are able, have a weekly, a weekly, that would be good, have an annual retreat to one of our SRF or YSS retreat centers, at least annual. Now, there are many of you who aren't able to do this. You don't live anywhere near them. But maybe there's a place out in nature that you can go for a day or two, just to step out of your normal daily environment. Getting away from your environment, it's like pushing a reset button on your life. You come back in with a fresh perspective, recharged, ready ready to go on with life. Devotees often come to the Greenfield Self-Realization Fellowship Greenfield Retreat in Virginia. A little fatigued from travel and maybe a little worried or nervous about taking a retreat. Maybe it's new to them. But what we see is that As they settle in and they attend a few group meditations and they're out in the beautiful nature, in a couple of days they're practically glowing. They shed the world and the light of their soul starts shining out through their eyes. It's a beautiful thing to watch. So if you're able, get out into nature, walk in nature, sit in nature, think, feel, listen, observe. One time, many years ago, one of the nuns was visiting at Greenfield. And I saw her standing out in the patio, and she had her hands in the air, all the way, hands all the way up, and her hands out like this. She was just standing there. And when I came out of the house, she turned around, and emphatically she said, the power of God in nature. (laughs) Like she was just joyously overcome by it. And it's true. What is nature but Divine Mother's expression? And Divine Mother's love is very, very powerful. Guruji says, Nature with her diamond-dazzling stars, the Milky Way, the flowers, birds, clouds, mountain sky, the countless beauties of creation, is the Divine Mother. In nature, you behold the Mother aspect of God full of beauty, gentleness, tenderness, and kindness. The beauty in the world bespeaks the creative, motherly instinct of God. And when we look upon all the good in nature, we experience a feeling of tenderness within us. We can see and feel God as mother in nature. When my mother was a child, her family had a tradition of Sunday being a quiet day. They'd go to church, and then they'd go walk out in the woods. And the children were encouraged to refrain from speak, speaking and to notice things, and that they would talk about it when they got home. What did they see while they were out there? And it, tra- it trained them to be observant, but it also trained them to be comfortable being with others in silence. So often we feel this need to talk whenever we're with, we're with other people. And Guruji says much energy is wasted 
in useless talk, and that excessive talking causes nervousness. Which, of course, is a paradox because nervous people usually want to talk a lot, and then that talking causes them to be nervous. So it's, it's not helpful. Guruji says, be with people in silence. Don't spend precious time and energy in idle talk. Eat in silence. Work in silence. God loves silence. Mahatma Gandhi had a day of silence every week. It was very important to him, and he, he would not break that, that day of silence for anything, not even when Paramahansa Yogananda visited him, not even when he was arrested one time. He wrote notes to his family and to his associates what to do while he was away, but it, it meant enough to him to keep that silence. We also observe a day of silence in, our, in Guruji's ashrams. And it's during that time when we have a break from that need to communicate with others, to interact with others, that, that compulsion to talk. It's in that time that we often gain insights into our own challenges and into the challenges of others and insights into ways that we can help them. It's how we stay in tune with Guruji, because we need this quiet time to recharge. We also observe silence while eating, thinking of God and the nutrition in the food. Do you know you get more nutrition out of your food when you, when you think about it when you're eating? You do. Dayamata explains. She says, Guruji discouraged talking at the table because it distracts you from concentrating on what you're eating. And this, in turn, inhibits the proper functioning of the life force that is responsible for digesting and assimilating the food. So learn to eat more slowly and in silence. So if you're not already doing this, see if you can. Sometimes it's challenging with a family because the, the table is often where a lot of communication happens, and communication is important for the harmony of a family. But maybe there's some way you can partially do it, like the first 10 or 15 minutes in silence, or one meal a day in silence. It's important. So there are other times that even in a busy family, you might be able to set aside one hour in the evening or on the weekend as quiet hour, where there's no electronics whatsoever, no phones, no video games, no television, no nothing. It's a time for reading, writing, drawing, meditating, just quiet time for one hour. It may be a little hard sometimes with, with some families, but once everybody gets used to it, they actually can find it very comforting. And you may also find that there's a reduction of tensions in the home. There is a safe place of silence within that each and every one of us can go to for security, for a sense of well-being, for love, for, a pe- for peace of mind. And if we can train ourselves to go there at will, then when we need it, when there are times when, when life isn't going so smoothly, then we know how to access that quiet area alone with God inside. And teaching children to do this is beautiful because it will benefit them in, in, in many ways. Children run across stresses these days that are far beyond any stresses that were in my carefree upbringing. The, li- uh, the world is more complicated right now. Guruji says, those who deeply meditate feel a wonderful inner quiet. The stillness within should be maintained even when in the company of other people. What you learn in meditation, practice in activity and conversation. Let no one dislodge you from that calm state. Hold on to your peace. In your inner temple of silence, receive God with your awakened intuition. So those of us who are 
deeply practicing these scientific meditation techniques that Guruji has given to the world to free us, to save us, will find that it becomes easier to shut the mind down and concentrate on God alone. It becomes easier to withdraw the life force from the senses and enter into that deeper stillness with God. So I hope you're all making use of the online meditations and and retreats. These are excellent for support. And those of you who are live near a temple, a center, a group, a kendra, make it a habit to be regular in your meditate in going to meditations there. It supports the group and it supports you. And you'll find great benefit from spending time in meditation with the groups. After his passing, Guruji once gave the message to our second president, Raja Sijanakananda. He told him, tell the devotees that I could come to them at any time, that I have the power to do so. But if I did, they wouldn't make a spiritual effort. They'd be satisfied. So instead, they need to come where I am. So don't waste precious time. Guruji's waiting, and he's given us all the tools that we need to advance into his presence. So in addition to your morning and evening meditations, if you can practice just little moments of silence throughout the day, or have a meal in silence, or have a day of silence, specifically set aside some time for seclusion. You're going to find great benefit to this. Some of you may feel that your circumstances aren't such that you can do this, and in this case, it's essential for you to do these little momentary practices, like we did earlier, the one breath, God, 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 or focusing at the Christ Center and saying, for God and Guru, for God and Guru, recognizing Divine Mother in nature, whispering your love to God in the, in the language of your own heart. Sister Gyanamata said, observe some rule of silence. It is in the silence of body, mind, and senses that you will hear God speak. Observe some rule of silence. It is in the silence of body, mind, and senses that you will hear God speak. So as you return to your daily life this next week, attempt to incorporate some form, extra form, of silence and seclusion into your day, into your week. We need to show Guruji that we are making the effort to go where he is. You know, we have to get in the ark of silence, not just sing about it, (laughs) and let it take us to the land beyond our dreams. Guruji loves you all dearly, and he's eagerly awaiting your coming. So we have a few moments now that we can practice Guruji's meditation on silence from metaphysical meditations. So let's sit up in the meditation posture. And let's inhale and tense the whole body. Exhale and relax. Let's do this two more times.
Now try to visualize and feel what Guruji is saying in this visualization as I read it out loud to you. My silence, like an expanding sphere, spreads everywhere. My silence, like an expanding sphere, spreads everywhere. My silence spreads like a radio song, above, beneath, left and right, within and without. My silence spreads like a radio song, above, beneath, left and right, within and without. My silence spreads like a wildfire of bliss. The dark thickets of sorrow and the tall oaks of pride are all burning up. My silence spreads like a wildfire of bliss. The dark thickets of sorrow and the tall oaks of pride are all burning up. My silence, like the ether, passes through everything, carrying the songs of earth, atoms, and stars into the halls of his infinite mansion. My silence, like the ether, passes through everything, carrying the songs of earth, atoms, and stars into the halls of his infinite mansion. Try to hold on to that feeling of expansion, that your consciousness in that stillness, in that silence, has expanded beyond your body like a sphere the expanding sphere spreading everywhere.
your mind has wandered, bring it back to the thought of God or to this expanding sphere of silence. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Father, Mother, Mother, Friend, friend, Beloved God, God, Jesus Christ, Christ, Bhagavan Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yuteshwar, Our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, religions. we bow to you all. all. Divine Mother, Mother, thy voice is silence. silence. In my soul silence, silence. may I hear thee speak. speak. Tell me, O Eternal Mother, Mother, that though I knew it not, not, thou hast loved me always. Om. Peace. Amen.